It's easy to think of sports as a modern invention. I mean, it's a whole industry now. Billions of dollars are tied up in it, and it employs tens of thousands of people. But the truth is, sports have been played by people of every culture for as long as humans have been around. Somewhere way back when, there were two cavemen named Ugg and Grug, and they wanted to prove which was stronger. Normally, they would just fight to the death, but someone way smarter than them suggested they do some basic skill tests. Who can run the fastest, who can lift the heaviest boulder, etc. After all, they need both Ugg and Grug on the next hunt, and it wouldn't do anyone any favors if one of their two best guys winds up dead. Who won has been lost to time, but sports took off back then and we've been playing them ever since. However, professional sports are relatively new. The idea that you could just play a sport full-time as your job is only about 100 or so years old. Even clear into the 1950s, plenty of NFL players had day jobs and they just played football for a little extra cash and the thrill of it. Only those in the highest levels of competition can make a living off of sports. But there is one sport where that is not the case at all. They have records that go back hundreds of years, and there's evidence that it has been played for well over a thousand years. And the players were professionals. They did nothing except play this sport. They had a ranking system, tournaments, and even sanctioning bodies centuries before anybody else did. And the best part is, this sport is still played today. It's the national sport of Japan, and you probably know it as sumo wrestling. The exact origins of sumo are a bit murky at best since it's so incredibly old, but there are prehistoric wall paintings depicting two men grappling with one another. But the oldest known manuscripts talking about sumo date back to 712 AD, in which a story of two kami or gods decided who would control a disputed province of Japan. The two opted to engage in a wrestling match between themselves rather than starting an all-out war. As the legend goes, the thunder god defeated the god of wind and water by quote, crushing his arm like a reed. That is incredibly descriptive and sounds incredibly painful. The way the manuscript is worded, it makes it sound as though the reader would understand the rules of this contest, which makes sense when reading the Nihon Shoki, or the Chronicles of Japan. Published in 720 AD, it claims the first sumo match was held in 23 BC, and in it, a man named Nomi no Sukune defeated his opponent in a match requested by the Emperor. Sumo, which literally translates to striking one another, became very popular at the court of the Emperor and Greater Lords. But back then, fights were to the death, so they were pretty few and far between. By the 1400s or so, sumo stopped being less of a spectacle for the powerful and became a sport for everyone. Events were held outdoors, and finally the rule set that we see today was formed. Fights were now a contest to see which fighter or rikishi could down his opponent. If anything but your foot touched the ground, you lost. Same as it is today. In 1578, the great unifier of Japan, Oda Nobunaga, held a tournament with 1,500 participants and invented the final piece of the puzzle, the dohyo, or ring. A raised clay platform would have a ring made of rice straw bales placed in a circle called the tawara. Now you could win by pushing or pulling your opponent out of the ring, and since then, the rules have been only slightly tweaked. It's pretty much the same today. So let's get into what a match would look like and explain a few things. On the dohyo are three men, the two fighters and a gyoji. He's the referee, and they even have their own ranking system. The two fighters will stare down and undergo some pre-fight rituals like washing their mouths with water as a show of cleansing oneself and throwing salt onto the ring to ward off evil spirits. This was done because most sumo tournaments back then were done at or near harvest time, and this would please the gods by putting on a show. The rikishi will then squat down and wave their hands out wide to show their opponent and the crowd that they have no hidden weapons on them and they intend to fight fairly. Once all that's out of the way, the two rikishi square off again, and the gyoji gives the final go-ahead. When both fighters have placed their fists onto the clay, the match is underway with a tachiai, or initial hit. If the tachiai is good, the gyoji will shout hakyoi, signifying that the match is underway. But there is no rule saying that you have to do the initial hit. You can just move out of the way and let your opponent get caught off balance. This is called a hinka move, and while it is considered a cheap shot, it's totally permitted. Both fighters wear mawashi belts made out of a single piece of long silk, and it's completely fine to grab it for leverage against your opponent. However, pulling the hair, striking with a closed fist, or winding up with a 90-degree arc open-handed strike is grounds for disqualification. But short slapping strikes are permitted as well as pushing your opponent by the throat. You can push, pull, or throw your opponent out of the ring or down them, and there are 82 official techniques for doing so. The most common ones are the simplest ones. Yorikiri, a frontal force out while in a clinch, and Oshidashi, a push out. 
However, there are some much rarer methods like the reverse backwards body drop or Tasuki Zori. These only pop up maybe once every 25 years or so, so it's really cool when one of them gets busted out live. Kyoko Zushizan, a rikishi from Mongolia, won using 50 different techniques across his career, a record that still holds today. When one man has either downed or forced out his opponent, the Gyoji points towards the winner's side and presents him the prize money. However, there are four judges outside the dohyo, and if they think the Gyoji got the call wrong, then they can summon a monoi, or judges conference. They discuss among themselves if a call is to be upheld or reversed, as some of these matches can be insanely close. However, a good chunk of the time, they err on the side of caution and order an immediate rematch right then and there if they can't agree on a winner. Which the fans love because, hey, more sumo's good, right? And fun fact, if a gyoji has a call reverse, it's customary to offer his resignation, which is always rejected. And the highest level of gyoji has a tanto blade stuffed into his sash, signifying that he is willing to take his own life via seppuku if he gets a call wrong. That's pretty intense, but as far as I can tell, that's never happened. But it is nice to see some accountability for the refs in a sport, to be honest. In the late 1850s, the United States Commodore Matthew Perry made contact with the nation of Japan and threatened to end their centuries-long period of isolation by force if necessary. Japan, for the first time in over 250 years, were now open to the outside world, and their Edo period ended, replaced by the Meiji Restoration, a time of rapid modernization. During that time, Perry observed a sumo match and saw it as backwards and barbaric. That attitude caught on as Japan quickly westernized. The sport was threatened with being thrown into the annals of history, but sumo still remained as a symbol of national pride going into the 20th century. And if there was anything good about Japan's nationalist phase going into World War II, sumo saw a resurgence in popularity as a symbol of national identity, and even survived and thrived in the post-war years. Unlike modern sports where players have homes and lives outside of the game, sumo wrestlers have their entire lives dominated by the sport. They live in what are called sumo stables, teams led by former rikishi, where the fighters live and breathe sumo. They live on the grounds, they practice day and night, and even eat and sleep at the stables. After all the training is done for the day, the rikishi eat chanko nabe, a pork, fish, and vegetable stew to replenish their bodies and fill them up with carbs for a good night's sleep. This also fattens them up, making them so big for the same reason NFL linemen are big dudes. A heavier guy is harder to push out of the way. Simple as that. In sumo, there are no weight limits. A rikishi weighing 200 pounds can fight guys weighing well over 400 pounds, and with a little bit of technique, the results can surprise you. He goes with a sabati attack, gets in low, has a grip, but can he do anything with it? It becomes a power game, you would favor Yoshi Azuma. He's a little awkward. Now pulled in very tight here. We'll need a leg trip, perhaps. Tries the leg trip and gets the throw. Kakinage. Sumo tournaments are held in every odd-numbered month in 15-day tournaments, where about 42 rikishi compete once a day against an opponent decided the day before by the sanctioning body, the Japan Sumo Association. Whoever has the best record at the end of the 15-day period is the champion and gets presented with the Emperor's Cup. If there's a tie at the end of the 15th day, a one-off playoff match is held and the winner takes all. And the best part is, you can actually watch all of this day by day on NHK Japan's website or on their YouTube channel for free. Links to those down below in the description if you're interested. And you might notice for the presenting of the championship or even just winning a round, you are not allowed to show any emotion. You are expected to remain completely stoic, win or lose. There are no pop-offs, triumphant yelling, or raised fists. Only tears of joy are permitted. What makes sumo sumo is its humility and stoicism. You are not just a rikishi, you are a representative of Japanese culture whether you are from Japan or not. If you're a foreigner, you take on a Japanese stage name and are expected to embody and represent Japanese values and customs. They let you compete of their own volition. They can always strip you of your rank and send you back home, if they feel like you don't embody the spirit of sumo. Steeped in centuries of tradition, you have no right to compete if you do not show deference to those traditions. And now we get into the ranking system of sumo and how you rise through them. Grand Sumo, or Makauchi, is comprised of the best of the best represented by five divisions. Maigashira are the rank and file guys who consist of rookies from the lower Juryo division who have worked their way up, journeymen, and guys looking to bounce back into the upper ranks, or Sanyaku. Komosubi and Sekiwake are guys who have put together multiple tournaments with winning records or have even won a tournament outright. Ozeki are the cream of the crop, guys who have won tournaments and have dominated their competition. But the best of the best is the top rank of Yokozuna. Since the 1600s, there have only ever been 73 men promoted to the top rank of Yokozuna. People have lived and died never seeing a single Yokozuna fight in their lifetimes. The Yokozuna is not just an elite level rikishi, he's more like a sumo god made flesh. 
The Japan Sumo Association can anoint a Yokozuna after a fighter has won back-to-back -back tournaments, but they don't have to promote you. You have to be a good representative of sumo and its traditions. If they don't like the cut of your jib, they don't have to make you a Yokozuna. For a long time, foreign fighters weren't permitted to become Yokozuna, but after a wave of American fighters from the Pacific Islands came to the forefront of Grand Sumo, Akebona was crowned as the first foreign-born Yokozuna and others were allowed to follow in his footsteps. The Mongols, as they have been trying to do for centuries, finally invaded Japan in the 2000s with no less than five Mongolian Yokozuna making the cut, the most notable of which was Hakuho, from Mongolia's capital city of Ulaanbaatar. During his career spanning from 2007 to 2021, he had the most championships of any rickshi at 45 and the most wins ever at 1,187. He competed at a rare time where there were multiple Yokozuna and Sumo in the late 2010s, and that saw a resurgence in the sport making it more popular than ever abroad. But if you ask any Japanese fan who they thought the finest Yokozuna was, they will unquestionably say Chiyo no Fuji. Hailing from Hokkaido, Japan, his piercing eyes gave him the nickname The Wolf, and he reigned as Yokozuna from 1981 to 1991. He was never a big man and thus he had to resort to daring throws to down his larger opponents. As such, he put tremendous strain on his body and racked up a few injuries. But in order to combat this, he took up an insane workout routine that involved up to 1,000 push-ups per day. He said in order to protect his joints, he would clad himself in muscle armor, and it worked. He went on an insane tear that resulted in the most championships that anybody had racked up in 20 years and the second most in history at that time. Throughout the 1980s, he was the most prolific sumo wrestler in the world and clicked off a 53-fight win streak, stretching from the May Tournament of 1988 to the November Tournament of the same year, at the time the fifth longest ever dating all the way back to 1782. He reinvigorated Japan's sumo scene, and they've been going strong ever since. Even to this day, history is still being written. The March 2024 tournament for the first time in 110 years was won by a rookie, Takaru Fuji. He did so working his way up from the lowest division to the highest in just 10 tournaments, the fastest ever done by a rickshi. Again, you can watch all this for free here on YouTube or on NHK's website. It is steeped in millennia of tradition and ongoing in its modern era for nearly 400 years. Its rituals and terminology are rooted in centuries of strict discipline and rigid practice. You owe it to yourself to watch a sumo tournament one day, if not in person, then at least online because it is the world's oldest professional sport and it's part of what makes us human. Whether you're enthralled by it or not, I would hope you would appreciate its place in the world of sports and would agree that it deserves a spot on the world stage, because without it, worldwide sports just would not be what they are today. Anyway, I'm Slapshoes, thanks for watching, and until next time, y'all take it easy and remain timeless.